right, we're ready to get started. Thank you for joining us for the Noon Gate Equity Webinar, where we explore topics related to equity and graduation success. I'm Kathy Anderson, OSCI Graduation and Equity Specialist. Today's topic is using data to enhance reflective practices. June's a good time to think about the year to come. Data's your friend for making smart decisions about where to focus. As we go along, if you have any burning questions you want answered, feel free to type them in, and they'll be monitored by Dixie. I'm joining today by Dr. Chuck Selina and Dr. Suzanne Gertz from Gonzaga University. They've written two excellent books from their experiences as the Sunnyside Turnaround Team, where they created the Leadership Lesson Plan to move their graduation rate from 41% to 85% in seven years. Pretty amazing. This plan focuses on quick wins in a 45-day cycle. They're going to share this tool with you. We're glad you both can be here today to share your expertise. All of our work at OSBI is grounded in the vision for every student to graduate from high school ready for career, college, and life. The mission of OSBI is to provide resources to schools and districts to ensure students are successful. In 2014, OSBI adopted agency-wide measures of success, including high school graduation and post-graduation enrollment and remediation course taking. At that time, OSPI implemented research-based performance indicators. These serve to guide our work across the K-12 public education system. The purpose of the webinar today is to support you in using data to enhance your reflective practices. To do this, we want to help you understand the process for finding peer mentors by using your data. We also want you to learn how to use our leadership lesson plan to get some quick wins in 45 days. Chuck and Suzanne are going to be talking about how to create timeless goals that can help guide your practice and the basics of the conceptual and action frameworks that support those timeless goals. I have a link here for the equity analytics, so if you want to look at them after the presentation, they'll be in the slideshow. The equity analytics are a tool that we've developed at OSPI to look at equity among student groups. In a district, they can use this tool to see where they stand in comparison to the state average and get a nuanced picture by filtering for only districts that look similar in demographics and enrollment. Their snapshot of the year past. So it's good to keep in mind that a school level data system will be more nimble throughout the year. We don't have a ton of time to look at them today, but here is a snapshot of some of the views available. You can see each district in the statewide summary with the state average on the left. And you can filter using these cool uh, slider bars right here for um, to match enrollment, low income, ELL, or percent special education. If you want to see your student groups, you can go to the district detail tab. Uh, the uh, further apart the bars are, the larger the gap. If you want to see who's doing well with gaps, you go to the performance tab, and here the districts are color coded so that you can draw a box around the districts uh, with a small gap who are doing well. I want to encourage you to take a look at these analytics if you haven't already. They really do put equity in perspective, and they're a great tool to help you find your focus for targeted supports. At OSCI, we use this data from the equity analytics to help us find highlight districts. Chuck and Suzanne come from Sunnyside, one of our first districts identified. What makes a district a highlight district? We look for a graduation rate that is better than the state average, which is sustained over time. We want districts with 50% or more low-income students, and we want to see a small gap between low-income and non-low-income students. We focused on large districts at first, and we've recently been looking at smaller districts. Wait, one question is, <clears throat> where do you find the equity analytics? So to find the equity analytics, you go to the OSBI homepage. You click on green button, which is data and reports. And then you go to the performance indicators, which should be the second row down. And it'll take you to all of the possibilities to get to those analytics. They're in Tableau. You want to make sure you click on that Tableau link for each one. And they're available for graduation, post-secondary, all of our performance indicators. You can see that data there. The moment that you've all been waiting for, we're going to switch over to Suzanne, Suzanne, can you tell us a little bit more about your leadership lesson planning and how you got there? Uh, you bet. Thank you for inviting us. We're over here in Spokane, Washington. So this first slide, we our aim is just to introduce ourselves so you understand if we've got relevance to you and then tell you what's coming up. So Chuck and I both have long 
history in education. Um, I'm, I was a high school teacher. He's taught at all levels and been a principal, and now we're both at Gonzaga University. So years ago, we entered into a research partnership with Sunnyside School District. That led later to them hiring Chuck as a turnaround principal when they got the school improvement grant, and I was the grant evaluator. Uh, we ended up writing a lot about that and then entering into partnerships with OSPI to expand on it as they really used the power of these equity analytics to identify folks who were reducing disproportionality. So that's what we've identified as the why of why we're all here doing what we do, and that is to pursue excellence through equity. And so when we, when we close those lines up, that Kefi was showing you, we're reducing disproportionality and, and seeking equity. We use those ideas to try and build some resources for you. So we've done a few of these tours <laughs> with OSPI, and the last one we thought went really well. People loved the idea of the leadership lesson planning, and of course the name 45-day plan caught on much faster. So we're going to talk about that today. We flipped our presentation to begin with that more tangible product um, and then we're going to tie into where did that research come from and how it supports that 45-day planning process towards the end. So hopefully time allows for all of that because this is a backwards version of what we usually do from theory to practice. We're going practice to theory. So um, Chuck's going to talk about that next. So the bottom line from our lens in terms of what we're looking at in the change process is what will I as a leader create a culture for learning? What will I do differently tomorrow based on what I know today? Uh, I think in the turning point for all of us, we, this uh, I'm sure many of you know who Carl Glickman is, but back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, he he asked, uh, from his research on effective supervision, he came to the conclusion that if teachers aren't able to uh, do what they, be successful in the classroom, it's really a leadership issue and not a teaching issue. So in the back of our lens, when we do our work, we're always looking at what will I do differently to improve teaching and learning for a culture for learning? And do we really believe as formal leaders in our district that each teacher can be successful, just like we, we ask teachers to focus on how do we help each student be successful. Uh, Arduous brings out a powerful concept of how do we connect what a leader does to the consequence or the performance of the organization. If we're going to be a learning leader, then how do we adjust, change, and divide, uh, and apply our, our behaviors in a, in a very intentional way? So when we look at change, what are the new behaviors we as formal leaders need to demonstrate to change the old beliefs of those we serve? We know that the game is going to continually come at us at 100 miles an hour. Just like a pitcher is throwing a fastball, uh, they continue to throw the ball at 100 miles an hour. So we know in the field that our work and how it comes at us so it will continually come faster and faster us, at us. So how do we as formal leaders slow the game down and be more intentional in our work so that we actually slow the game down and we call that to the leadership lesson planning process. So if we look at it, our belief is that formal leaders' uh, role is to create healthy systems. And if the leader change, the change process cannot occur without the leader lighting the fuse. And if you look at the teachers in the in the uh, or the systems of the teachers in the field as the dynamite holding together, we can get a larger bang for your our, our change process if we're working collaboratively together. So what do I need to do different as a leader? So uh, what we want to share with you, we found out in, the, in working with leaders when we asked them in time and again, what will you do differently tomorrow to improve a culture for learning? And a lot of the responses that came back from uh, principals and leaders in the district was, well, we need our principals to do more of, or we need our teachers to do uh, more of this or that. When we kept pressing the question, what will you do differently to uh, develop a culture for learning, it really came down to a lack of awareness of what will I do differently as a formal leader in the district to, cre to create a culture for learning. So we, we started looking at that and how do we then support leaders in, in terms of 
uh, intentionally identifying their work. A lot of times the school improvement planning process creates long-term goals and long-term outcomes, but what are the immediate things that I need to do differently tomorrow to support my teacher? So this is for the leader um, uh, of, of defining their work. We have also found like uh, many of the goals that are established are really broken down into more uh, very specific outcomes over time. And we found that having a limited number of goals that were timeless that really drive process it had a bigger impact in the change process. It's also how do leaders engage in their uh, collaborative inquiry process. We expect teachers to move and discuss on a regular weekly basis, uh, typically in their PLC work. But what focuses leaders to look at leadership issues in their PLC process so that they're talking about not management issues, but how I will lead the building. And we encourage that this process is done twice weekly. And like we've said earlier, it's grounded in a very short period of time. And it, we recommend 45 day calendar days in the process of establishing such plans. And it's grounded in evidence um, of what it is to establish quick wins. So what we've, we've provided for you is uh, this is just a sample of the product. Uh, we'll talk more about it so you can envision what it looks like it, we're, uh, in terms of it. This particular plan uh, that we're looking at is over, you can see their 45 day plan uh, started in October in this particular example, but it's continuous and ongoing and, and uh, they, their, their first goal is what drives that work, which is around uh, a collaborative culture. But what we've found in the districts that some districts that have been using it for three to four years, the they actually have a running uh, history of their actions that they've done differently as it relates to these goals. And I'll, I'll describe how these goals now were developed. We want you to begin within the mind. So we call them timeless goals. And that that means for us that they tend to be driven by our work regardless of our subsets, our actions, our activities that we're doing. And we recommend no more than four. And in reality, with the districts we work with, sometimes we only start with two about what it is that drives our work. So here's here here's some examples of the of what we would consider timeless goals. The the first goal is really about how do we engage in collaborative work or collaborative inquiry in that process that impacts teaching and learning. So it's around what we call the CIA framework. It's the connection of what I teach, the curriculum, how I teach the instruction, and how do I know if they've learned it, the assessment practices. So we feel that everything we do is grounded around uh, how do we collaborate with each other to improve teaching and learning. The second uh, is, is grounded in data. And how do we align data to develop systems of support for, for, for teaching and learning? So how do we use data? How do we align it to our school-wide systems? Typically, systems are defined around behavioral management, social, emotional, and, uh, and academic. The next goal that we feel is timeless is around how do we meet the social, emotional needs of our students, and how do we connect them to the school so they have, are able to envision our future. And then the last is how do we engage our local and school community. This, quite honestly, is, the, is a very difficult step for a lot of leadership teams of how to identify what are our four timeless goals that center and ground our work, whether we're at the district level or at the building level. So for each goal as a leadership team, we need to start going to whether, we're, obviously we're looking at it through a building lens, but we could look at it at a district lens. What, what's our current reality for each of these goals? What, what are people saying? And we, we basically look at four types of data in this process. The first is perceptual data, which was bolded because, quite honestly, that is probably your most powerful data. Uh, demographic data, achievement data, and contextual data, which center around what kinds of programs do we have established to support each of the related goals. When we're gaining traction and discussing these goals, it's, it's, under, uh, it's, it's basically starting with, as a leadership team, what do we believe our current reality is? And what does our ideal look like? What is it that we would like to move toward? And then what is realistic, something we can do within a 45-day uh, period uh, to, make, uh, to make this happen? 
And finally, what evidence would we accept? So in our in, in initially thinking, it's our best thinking as a leadership team uh, without too much outside information of what do we define our current reality, what do our, our ideal look like. Our belief is, is that leaders need to know where they're moving people toward without controlling uh, the situation, but willing to be influenced. After you start gaining traction, uh, you start you start developing some action steps, and this is really tough to get traction of whether it's around where we're at with our PLC work and our collaboration, what data are we using to create systems of support, or where are our students connected to our school, or how are our stakeholders involved. The reality is that as we develop our action steps, now we go to the people we serve, and, and those would be our key stakeholders, and this is what we call the power of one-on-ones. We start talking to individual stakeholders, starting uh, within our schoolhouse with our teachers and doing reality checks. This is what we're thinking about. Do we have it right? What are we doing well? What should we do differently? What's one school-wide change you would think would make to help us be more successful? Be kinds of questions uh, we would ask. At this time, we're actually doing action research. We're actually scripting our questions as a leadership team of what it is we want to know in relationship to our goal, what are our stakeholders telling us, and we come back in our PLCs and our collaborative inquiry process, and we're actually doing a thematic analysis of what are the big ideas. The, the idea here, though, I want to overemphasize is that this, we want it to be immediate, not to get overengaged with too much uh, data as uh, you know, uh, I think it was full and set drip, data rich, information poor. What we want to do is be able to be nimble and be able to change and be moved quickly based on what our, our, our colleagues are telling us. But again, it's us as a leadership team being clear of what's next and then gaining information from our colleagues. Do we have it right? And then are we willing to be influenced by our stakeholders of what they're telling us to do? Okay. So, after we kind of you start dancing with the data and you start dancing with the uh, the goals, and I know this sounds a bit overwhelming because it is, it's pretty fast paced. The, I, we believe the art of leadership is how do we get others to a place of saying what are that we willing to be held accountable for. So as we our goals emerge, as our action plans start to be developed, then we ask each other on the leadership team who's going to be accountable for what within either the goal or the, or the action steps that come under the goal. And then that person becomes the, we call them the, the head gardener or takes care of that, the, that, uh, that goal and or action step. And at that point in time, they lead the process within the leadership team around the next 45 days as it emerges and being developed. So the initial step is there's a collective ownership, but the second step is that individual then becomes the tender of that garden. And again, what uh, we have found a very simple uh, aspect of moving away from the term result-driven and to become product-driven makes it safer for people to engage in the work. So what products would I, I create to support evidence that I'm moving closer to my uh, outcome as it relates over those 45 days, and we're looking for quick wins. So what perceptual data would it look like? Is there any achievement data, demographic, or contextual data that would allow us to look at quick wins? And when we show you the template, at the, each, at the end of each 45 days, each person then needs to be able to declare what evidence they've collected but what, uh, to say that, hey, we accomplished what it is we want to go up to. And we also encourage to make your thinking visible to everyone, embrace transparency in that we share the plan with the entire building of what we're doing and, and why we're doing and what success looks like. And because we're regularly communicating those that are being impacted by the plan, we're continually gathering perceptual data that helps us modify and adjust our planning process. And so what we hope as a result of such intentional planning over 45 days and that we're having a living running record that every week we're discussing our 45 day plan, we're now working with Covey would call in the not urgent but important category, that we're slowing the game down. We're no longer trying to put out fires, we're engaged in weekly ongoing problem solving processes on our work that moves us toward our goal. So it's more centered, centered around being preventing a fire, but building relationship 
with those people that are doing work. We're having ongoing planning and we're implementing systems to support what teachers and our stakeholders or whatever level we're working at so that we're developing our capacity throughout our work. Now, if, if it, we're in that 45-day planning process and we're continually collecting data around our work and what it is, we like to call it again our lesson plan for design. Just like in the classroom, we're asking teachers to monitor and adjust and change based on all the forms of data they're collecting throughout their work. It's the same uh, for leaders. How do we develop when we, we have issues, we have fires, we have uh, something going on? And because people are engaged in this planning process with us, by us having conversations, we developed active action teams. I, I can tell, tell you countless stories about from the field around the planning process and action teams and how it's self-correct. I can vividly recall in our PE department, for example, we were continually actually taking kids out of the class as one class principals had the autonomy to actually say, okay, we'll waive the PE requirements so that then you can take a core class to make up maybe English deficiency, et cetera. And we found, you know, obviously a lot of the uh, PE teachers felt like that we weren't paying uh, credence to their, to their program by taking kids out. And they said, hey, we own our kids. We will find alternative ways. But we're still losing tremendous amount of students, especially young women, to the PE requirement. They wouldn't suit up. They wouldn't engage. And they, they created an action team on their own. They then sat down with students, problem solved the process. We found out that by having after school programs, more of a curve approach to uh, different alternative uh, choices for them to get their PE credits to engage it, because quite honestly, they didn't want to dress down. They didn't want to be part of the pro program. So they actually, through their action process, were able to develop different avenues to promote student success uh, during that process. So action teams are living process within the 45 days that you can engage those to uh, help you self-correct based on the evidence you regularly collect. So I'll turn it over to Matt, uh, Suzanne and she'll explain a little bit more deeply about goals and how to make them timeless and process oriented. So you can see there's this um, combination, a balance of the timeless goals, these things that are eternal and that you will never fully actualize but are always processing towards and then the action teams that are very short-term, nimble, able to move on issues that data point to. So when we put up these example goals, first of all, they did come from research. It wasn't just, you know, intuition, best thinking, that kind of stuff. And then we built on them further with Washington State-specific research. And, and that's what I'm most proud of, of everything in, in our two books and the resources we've got on the Gates website. They all come from, you know, a dozen Washington State school districts. This is Washington research, what works in Washington to reduce that equity gap. So that's the power of, of what you're hearing about now. This stuff worked. It's not just theoretical research. So when we put up these goals and kind of push the audience to consider what some of their goals were, it was interesting. Um, instead of finding things around the themes of collaboration, data, systems, culture. They went right to, right to results, what results they wanted, instead of goals they aspired to. And I think that's very human nature. But to, to tweak a common phrase, results happen. You will always get some results. <laughs> it doesn't describe the process or the next step. However, a timeless goal can do that. We can see some things timeless goals do not do. If your goal is centered around graduation rate, you're defining an outcome or a result in, certain, in terms of a single data point. Think bigger. Timeless goals do not focus narrowly on content area achievements, like higher test scores or singular behavioral outcomes. Yes, the data analytics will show you all of these things, but they all live in a complex way within these bigger timeless goals. And so when you go to the 45-day plan, you're going to see each of those things across multiple timeless goals come at from different perspectives depending on the goal you're working within. So timeless goals do cross those content areas and look at multiple data sources simultaneously. 
they really honor the complexity of your work and focus on building your culture, which then results in an outcome. They engage and impact all of your stakeholders and help you understand process within the context of your lines of inquiry that are happening in your system. And so this then brings us to the idea of the action framework, which I'm, I'm going to show you a picture of and talk a little bit more about soon. So, Dan, um, can I, we have a question. Um, do you have a recommended process for how to establish timeless goals? Uh, what that looks uh, like? That, that's a great question. And, and if we can come back to it, because we did begin with end in mind, in terms of looking at the action framework and the conceptual framework, we know we know there are big themes in the research that we came through that drove our thinking with the teams we have worked with. We know that collaboration is a big uh, uh, is a theme, and data is a theme, and social emotional needs of students are a theme. So, uh, in our thematic analysis of the research, we tried to say, okay, what are they consistently telling us that we need to tend to establish a culture for learning? And we also know less is more. So, I think when we come back to the conceptual framework and the action framework, they'll make the connection, they'll be able to have a conversation, especially from the action framework, what should drive our conversation of, of developing timeless goals? If not, we'll come back, uh, we'll try to see if that person has a deeper question after that. And one resource I would like to point out, and, and we will get to all these at the end of this slide deck, so this is a great question that leads us right where we're going, is that there is a, an instrument on the GATE website, that's graduation of team effort, that is called the current reality instrument. And it's aligned to everything we're talking about today and lets you really get um, a, a dipstick of where you're at right now in terms of your current reality. And then you can compare it to some of the pictures I'm about to describe and say, wow, we can see where we need to go. We can see what our ideal is and then start talking about the steps to close the gap, which are also in the resource document that I'm going to point out. Yeah, just to go a little further is that research document uh, that Susanna uh, referred to was developed by the research we did with those outlier schools. So it's grounded in the practices. Flush that out even deeper here in a minute. Okay, so, you know, one of the things we heard over and over again from, from school districts is that, you know, the process is not a straight line. It's not this school improvement plan that you start in the beginning and see through for a year, put it on the shelf and check off the box. It's messy. There are detours. There's readjustments. And that's what the 45-day planning document allows you to do. You become much more nimble and able to move within your system. And um, to address, I don't see who asked the question, uh, but to address that idea of where do your goals come from, your, your new ideal continually moves as you adjust your current reality based on uh, this research and the instruments we're going to show you. We'll, we'll put something in your hands so you can go back or with your leadership team, you can actually start to use this and develop even one one or two goals and some action steps and just see for the first 45 days who's doing what, what kind of data are you collecting, and how can we become intentional about moving forward. So where we got those themes that you're going to see in these documents, we started like we, we shared the story about the turnaround school in Sunnyside, but then we had an entire cohort of large school districts and just recently added a new cohort of smaller school districts. So we went and visited them. We interviewed staff, students, administrators, um, everyone's favorite, surveys. Uh, we collected artifacts and looked at all their external reports to try and put these things in the blender and slush out um, what, what was the, the real turning points, the things you could hold on to that caused change. And so in Washington, here's what we found, this action framework, which sometimes I abbreviate AF, which makes Kepi laugh at me every time, for those of you who know what that abbreviation means. So we're going to write it out, action framework. Um, <laughs> if you look in the center, what we're trying to do is actualize a culture for learning. 
So let me back up a minute, and if you're jotting down notes, here's the overarching ideas. Why do we do what we do in pursuit of equity? That's our why. Well, some people stop and consider that. Some of us feel like we don't have time. It's so important to linger there. The very next thing people want to do is, okay, how do I get there? They jump to the how. And this is what I'm describing right now, is the how. How do you work? And so we've got these interacting um, themes that emerged from our research that have the, the large circle, the leadership team. This is where you're doing the action planning to integrate the other pieces below. And so an example of the work that happens from here is the 45-day plan. Of course, you need data to act on, and so you can see the data team sphere. Um, different groups, stakeholders are involved in this, often counselors, but not always. Um, this looks different based on your context. They're getting information from teachers and instructors in the, the collaborative instructional teams who are doing their day in, day out work and assessments and really seeing on the ground the, the reality of the school and informing, the circle off to the right, the school-wide systems, the systems that are needed to support students. And so that feeds right back into the 45-day planning. Are our systems doing what they need to do? Are there some missing? Are there some that are extraneous? Sometimes we find they're not working. And in a 45-day plan, you can get rid of it if it's not working. Um, so we have a lot of stories about this. And obviously, this is just the overview. And uh, we're hitting the highlights. But again, this is the, the how do we do our work. But we contend that if you don't know what you're doing, the how becomes much less impactful. So it begins with your why. We're working towards equity. And then your what, and then after that, you get into your how. So this is the conceptual framework. Um, this is the basis, the mother, if you will, of the work that got the incredible results at Sunnyside that Kefi mentioned earlier on. In fact, we think they were higher, Kefi. We think that they're in the 90s percentage and, and holding in terms of graduation rate. But, but who are we to argue with OSPI, right? So. Uh, more accurate. <laughs> well, let's go with the higher number then. If we get to pick. Higher number. <laughs> All right. So I we presented this several ways before, and I'm told I really should start with the most important thing instead of leading to the most important thing. So that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start with the idea of relational trust. This is the glue we found that held everything else together and made it work. We define relational trust as feeling safe, but not necessarily comfortable with another, having something to offer that person, and believing they're going, that person that has something to offer is going to provide time and expertise. They're willing to put in the time for you. If you have these three things, you're building relational trust. Now, it is important to point out that this was not simply about teacher to administrator having trust. But it was also, of course, conversely, administrator to teacher, but also across the administrative team, across teachers, from teacher to student, and even student to student. We saw the relational trust build in the students, and they even started to create systems of support for each other that I can describe to you later when there's time for storytelling. So that is um, the bedrock of our conceptual framework that has these other two pieces on top of it that you try and overlap as much as possible. On the left, you see academic press. Now this is a, something that we have a long history with. A hundred years of American education has focused on academic press, which is pushing for the rigor, the belief in um, high standards, of pushing success for all. We have doubled and tripled down and put billions in the efforts of curriculum and instruction in the efforts of pressing our students for higher achievement. This is intuitively a place where money goes. 
but we know that if this is the only place where you press, that achievement actually goes down. Because if you're going to press, you need to simultaneously support. So if you look on the right-hand side, this is where you're building the systems of support um, within either your building or your district. It's even better if they cross those imaginary lines where you're helping people meet those goals around behavior and their social emotional goals and academic. So when these three things maximize their overlap, this is where you're going to get the maximum impact. Okay. So I know that all went very fast and seems very theoretical, but there are real stories behind every single one of these things. Some of the stories are in the book. Some of them we'd love to just share with you in person. And on the next slide, you can see we've got a lot of resources that can help you if you want to dig deeper, if any of this jives and you think, oh, yeah, maybe Washington State research uh, relates to me too. So we've described leadership lessons, things that happened that led to great ahas. Not only are those on the book, but they're kind of teased on our, on our website, Powerless to powerful.com that's the number two powerless to powerful.com and the supporting principles underneath those we took the research themes and factors and indicators and we built surveys for you to use now i can almost hear the collective ug when uh, across the the internet here when you hear the word surveys but let me describe what they are. There's a survey that looks at all the factors in the conceptual framework, the what you're doing. There's a survey that looks at the action framework, how you're doing it. Together, this might inform the development of your goals. And then a larger instrument, your current reality, that blends some of these things and, and gives you some uh, descriptions of indicators if this stuff's happening in your building. Now, it doesn't mean you need to hand out a survey and have people sit down, fill this whole thing out beginning to end. We've seen leadership teams use them in a variety of ways. They've pulled one prompt and used it to start a meeting, like an entry task. They've had you know, different focus areas. This month, we're focusing on this, and here's how we're going to be intentionally asking questions around it. It doesn't mean you're handing out pen and paper surveys necessarily, although you might want to. The GATE website, Graduation of the Team Effort, has all of this material on it, and that's through OSPI. You can just go into their search box and put Graduation of Team Effort, and it comes up. And then, of course, there's our, our website and books if you'd really like to, to get the depth of understanding. Uh, I would also like to add back to the original question, about timeless goals and what they are. Uh, I think one of the things our work emphasizes is uh, we have taken the research and we have simplified it to big ideas through a thematic approach. We believe our work is complex, not complicated, meaning easy to understand but hard to apply. And complicated is more of a what we consider a checklist approach to change. So the real power of the process of having timeless goals that are process-oriented is it allows the leadership team to construct their own meaning within their own context. How do we use data to change, make change? How do we use collaborative inquiry and what evidence do we accept? That, that is within the context specifically. So you make sense of as you go. And the beauty of the 45-day planning is it builds on itself. When, when uh, Kepi sends out the example that we have of one page for each goal, you'll notice um, you will notice on that template color coding of green and red where districts are talking to each other and say, yeah, this is making sense. Um, and the red means, hey, we're not quite there yet, or we have to change it, or it's obsolete. If you look carefully at the evidence they accept, uh, they're declaring, this is what I'm willing to be held accountable for as I lead this process. This is my product at the end of 45 days that's formative and summative, not a, of here's what I did and here's how it informs me. If you know then over time, Mike, we have some that are three years long that will show the growth patterns around whether it be their, the work that they're doing in their, in their uh, PLC work, what kind of data they are to improve attendance. And the real question is, 
how do we align that data for a leadership team to create our systems of support that we, we talk quite a bit in uh, our second book about how do we organize so that we don't get hung up on tier levels of support. That emerges over time. But what are the things that we are doing so that we don't become activity driven, but we become more uh, driven about our culture and shift in culture for teaching and learning. So uh, we've done the impossible. Uh, we've covered, uh, we've covered, uh, if you will, uh, probably about <laughs> two years of, of thinking and research. Uh, so uh, turn it back to you, Kathy, and, and see what questions that we can do and see if we've made sense in such a short period of time. So I'll just say one more time, thank you, Chuck and Suzanne. I wanted to remind folks, and you mentioned it, that, that many of the resources that we're talking about today are on the GATE website. And if you go to the search engine on the OSPI homepage and just type the word GATE, the GATE homepage will come up. And all the materials are under the Graduation Equity Initiatives tab. So all of these resources that Suzanne and Chuck talked about, we have put right there in a toolbox for you. We continue to fill that toolbox and put additional resources in and update the resources that we have there as we continue to do our outlier work. And I'll say one more thing, that at OSPI we use the equity analytics not just for graduation but across the other performance indicators as well, including post-secondary enrollment, ninth grade success, uh, chronic absenteeism, and those are just a few that, that I'm more involved with because it's, they're in my unit. But when we've gone out and done a similar process to what Suzanne talked about around talking to those positive outliers and doing guided conversations, interviews, site visits with those districts that are showing positive results in whatever indicator, we're seeing the same type of themes come up, the same type of comprehensive systemic approaches to the work that were described in this uh, webinar today. So the themes are holding across the indicators, which to me just speaks to just a foundational approach to whenever you want to address something and build strong systems and a culture for learning, uh, it's going to impact whatever indicator you look at. So um, strategies may vary, but the foundations are uh, showing to be consistent. Our contact information is here, so if you have questions about um, strategies and need support, um, you can contact Dixie Grunenfelder or me, Kathy Anderson. Or if you want to learn more about Action Research and their amazing journey at Sunnyside, you can contact Chuck and Suzanne. So that's what we have for today.